Hello everybody and thank you for joining us for today's virtual business briefing. My name is Jeremy McArdle and I'm the Head of Business Markets with Electric Ireland. Electric Ireland is delighted to be collaborating once again with UCD on the UCD Marketing Development Programme. We firmly believe that by giving marketing students the opportunity to work in a practical way with commercial companies and commercial activities that it will help develop their skills and smooth their entry into the workforce as professional marketeers. Today's topic, necessity, the mother of innovation for SMEs, is probably a never been a more pertinent topic for our conversation with the challenges that the COVID-19 crisis is raising and imposing for us as a community and as a country as a whole. For the business community, the SME sector is probably bearing the brunt of this more than others, but we're already beginning to see some innovative responses to this as the country and the economy begins to open up. In Electric Ireland, we have a deep history of working with the business community in Ireland, and we've seen many challenges in the past, and I'm pretty confident that we'll come out of the back of this one too. I'm really looking forward to a very informative discussion and panel session, and thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much for that, Dermot. And uh, my name is Jonathan McRae. I'm a communications consultant with Wimsmart and a broadcaster. I'm delighted to be uh, hosting this panel as we look at what the future is like for small to medium enterprises in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, as much as we can understand it. And I'm delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel to tease that out today. So uh, our panel, are assistant professor, Stephen Kinsler, who's from the University of Limerick. He's an award-winning writer and author. Um, we have Lauren Murphy from Bizu, a recent startup that helps retailers get online. And she'll tell us all about that in a bit. She's been uh, a lecturer on social media and worked with various uh, social media agencies over the years. So she might give us the perspective from a comms angle. Uh, and we're also going to speak to Garrett Flower, who is a serial entrepreneur. He set up a smart bakery. He set up a uh, park PNP, a sort of Airbnb for for parking spaces and now there's a new venture called Park Office that allows companies to organize and manage their, their car parks to maximize occupancy. Uh, it'll be great to hear all of your perspectives. I'm really looking forward to the chat, but maybe uh, Stephen, we might start off with you. Uh, we heard um, Pascal O'Donoghue say recently that this is uh, an AC style recession we're about to face with 300,000 people likely to lose their jobs. It, have we seen anything like this? Do we, do we even know what the future looks like? Well, unfortunately, we don't. Um, the, the, the only comparable uh, economic shock is in the 1930s, and it is broadly dwarfed by what we've experienced in the last couple of months. Um, just to, at the time that we're recording this, the unemployment rate in Ireland is 28%. Uh, for just a, a sense of scale, in the 19, early 1930s in America, during what they now call the Great Depression, uh, it was just slightly above 30%. So, you know, the, the, the scale of the damage and the shock to um, the economy is it, it, it really the, the only word is unprecedented. And it's a, that it's it, it, it is so unprecedented that the word unprecedented has become overused. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's the real shock of this. It's a more shock to vocabulary um, in terms of the Irish economy. Um, it looks like about a third of um, all businesses have had to sh shut entirely. Um, there are 2.2 uh, million workers in this uh, economy. In February, almost all of them were in work. Um, and as we speak today, there are a million adults being supported by the government um, in, in, in one uh, shape or, or another. It is, um, it, it's really, uh, again, unprecedented. The, the, one of the ways I like to think about this is I'm compartmentalizing the shock and its response. So right now we're in a disaster relief phase. The economy has experienced the financial equivalent of a tornado or a, or a tidal wave or something. Um, and then we have to move from a disaster relief phase to a stimulus phase. Um, and that's going to be very, very important for businesses um, throughout the country because the more stimulus there is, the more likely they are to survive. This recession, do we do we experience recessions differently now than, say, for example, back in the, the, the earlier part of the 20th century? Are recessions likely to last a shorter period of time? Because that that culling, uh, essentially, of a third of Irish businesses sounds terrifying. How, how long are we likely to see that that uh, period last? So. The most, most recent modeling on this comes from the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, 
they compared the crisis response from the last uh, uh, great economic crisis in 2007, and that took seven years to uh, uh, return us to the level that we were at before uh, it, it hit us. They're modeling that it will take us three years to get back uh, to where we were in terms of economic growth. Because, and that, that's assuming that the virus is very short-lived and we have what's called a V-shaped uh, recession. And we can talk about that later if you like. But I think the, the most important point here is that the minute the virus is contained or can go away, a lot of stuff can go back to something approaching normal. But I, I think that normal will be different uh, on a sector by sector basis. So, Lauren, obviously key to um, the SME landscape are the retailers and COVID is something that has been uh, particularly uh, devastating for, for many retailers. And I imagine that the third of business that are going to fill a large amount of those are going to be retailers. You're in that space now. Can you tell us a little bit about Bizu and, and what it's what it's hoping to do and whether or not COVID has been a, a, a good time to be in this market? Absolutely. Uh, so we set out um, to create Bizu about uh, two years ago. Um, and the premise of the business was to create um, an online marketplace where independent Irish retailers with physical bricks and mortar stores could sell online. Because a huge amount of Irish retailers, in fact, less than 20% uh, of Irish independent retailers, they don't have um, websites. So that was the, the basis of the business. We wanted to give them a place where, where they could sell online. And, and that's what we did. And of course, then the coronavirus came. And um, as you said, it was completely unprecedented. Um, and we were delighted that we could give them um, a place where they could sell when they were essentially on their knees. Is it, is it tricky for a, a company that sells you know, jeans on a shop floor to transition to selling virtually uh, without incurring a lot more costs? Well, with BSU, that was one of our, one of our biggest um, unique selling points is that we don't charge any subscription to the retailer. So a lot of the time, if you're on like, a lot of our competitor sites, like I won't go naming them, but you either get charged um, based on your sales as a retailer, you get charged a commission, or you get charged like a monthly subscription. And we don't do either of that um, with our retailers. So what we're doing is we're trying to make it as easy as possible for the retailers uh, to compete with, with these big online giants. And one of the ways that we can do that is give them a marketplace where they can uh, trade for free. So any of the ways that uh, any of our revenue streams as a business doesn't get passed on um, to the retailer. Garrett, uh, this is uh, a true test for any entrepreneur and none, um, none more so for yourself because setting up a, 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 an enterprise app for parking in offices when no one is driving to their office is, is possibly one of the biggest business challenges. Talk to us about your reactions when you heard uh, about the COVID-19 lockdown and thought about this, uh, th th this business uh, model that you had that was very much based on people going to work. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. I suppose, you know, COVID-19 came like a good punch to, to many people around the world. Um, I suppose... You know, I started my first business in the last recession, so I was used to uh, used to seeing seeing the uh, getting used to analyzing the point that this is going to pass. Okay, so the first thing to do is to realize it's going to pass. The second is to put in place a plan of what you're going to do in the meantime and how you're going to survive. So we put in place a, a twenty week plan of of how we're going to get past this, and and in that time. You know, we have two solutions, parkbnp.com, which is a marketplace for parking in Ireland, Ireland's number one marketplace. And that went 95% down in, in the space of two weeks. And um, so a really drastic change. Um, and really, we found there's nothing we can do there because people are in lockdown and there's nothing we can do. But we knew that that was going to come back. The second part is park office, which is um, essentially hot desking for large office buildings. And one of the things we did in that action plan is to go out and talk to our uh, clients, our customers, and ask them, you know, what, what does rollout look like? So when this is over, what is it going to look like coming back to the office? And we probably did that earlier than most. And one of the benefits from doing that is that we were able to hear that there wasn't very much planning involved in terms of what's going to happen. And we were early to that to that discussion 
And what we found is that a lot of people were going to be worried about public transport. They see, you see a lot of uh, articles coming out now, the New York Times, et cetera, stating that 60% plus of people um, are scared of public transport. I think the Irish Times at the weekend said, you know, uh, two, three out of four people are, are terrified of public transport. So what's actually happened is because of that proximity we've got to our customers, they were telling us we want to be able to roll out back out to the office effectively and safely. And so our platform has added new features to allow that to happen. Like we have a health checker every day. So every day you're driving into the office, it asks you, how are you feeling? Before An hour before you're supposed to arrive. And you can actually answer the health assessment before you even get to the office. Obviously, you're someone who's deeply embedded in technology. And I'm wondering what, what advice would you give to SMEs in terms of uh, maybe looking at their, their costs and trying to reduce those uh, through technology? Yeah, I think this presents a huge opportunity for the world to bounce back quicker than ever through technology. And I don't think that people realize that we're in a, an area and a, a time of exponential growth. You know, think how quickly companies like Stripe have blown up and, and hired thousands upon thousands of people. Great Irish success story. So I think when you look at that and how we've we've been incubating for the last two and a half months, how many young entrepreneurs have now got these amazing next strike business ideas and are actually going for it. One of the most exciting things I've found is every Saturday I'm talking to new entrepreneurs about their business ideas who are using this time effectively to go after the passion that they, they want to go after. And one of those entrepreneurs, you know, was, was over 50. And I love the fact that this is his first business ever. And that's, that's, that's what this time has done. It's an incubation period for many. Stephen, do you see um, SMEs changing their, their structure and how they work quite dramatically forever as a result of, of what's happened with COVID-19? Um, I think that what will happen is what happened with the previous pandemics uh, that I, I've, I've, like everyone, I've become an expert <laughs> on pandemics in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've read a lot about it, actually. Um, if you look at the 1918, 1957 and 1963 pandemics, what you see are um, two reactions. The first is people work really hard to forget. So right after that, right after 1918, you have the roaring 20s. Right. So you just you, you have this kind of like societal overreaction, but you also have a burst of innovation. And I, I, I think we'll see a bit of that. There's, there'll be a bit of um, if, you, if, if we find a, a vaccine in September, say, or October, and we can all just take a shot. We will do our level best as a, as a group of society to forget this thing ever happened. Um, if it keeps on going for two or three years, then we won't be able to do that. We'll have to find a way to uh, dance around it. And technology can help us dance around it. And SMEs are where the, these new technologies uh, uh, get found and get embedded. So, yeah, I, I, I see that there's going to be a whole host of new opportunities. Lauren, you were a social media lecturer in the Digital Marketing Institute. And my question to you is, when we think of uh, not just retail, but SMEs in general, how important is social media now when you can't see the person face to face? So important. So important. I'm glad you asked. Obviously, because a huge amount of people are spending so much time at home in their pajamas on the couch, there's been a massive spike in people using social media and a massive uh, spike in engagement, a massive spike in screen time. But that also represents a massive opportunity for a retailer or indeed, you know, any any business um, if they're trying to engage with someone or um, sell something online. Um, so it's it's really about being present on social, like for, indeed for any of the, the retailers that we work with, we're telling them now to just be online every day. And because they're not, um, a, a lot of them like, there's, a, there's a, a certain things, like a lot of them will say, oh, will it cost me money? I don't think I have the know-how to do it. But the best thing to do is just go online every day and just try and engage with people every day. Because if you're not in your shop and you're not working, people do have a little bit more extra time in their hands now. And I think a lot, indeed, a lot of the retailers that we're working with are sort of mastering um, the skill of, of going online and creating engaging content and, and opening up their community. And it's been really, really beneficial for them in terms of actually driving people either to their own social media channels or to their own websites. Stephen, from um, 
a, an economic point of view, are there financial things that small and medium enterprises should not be doing right now in terms of taking out loans or investing in capital? What, what are the things that from, a, from a, an economic point of view don't make sense as, a, as an SME? I guess the, the, the first and most important thing is um, any loan, it might be cash flow positive, but it's balance sheet negative. So you, you, owe, the, you owe the thing back. And uh, even the most, uh, probably the best loan you can get right now from the Irish government is a deferral on your VAT payments. So I think it'll, it'll it's, you get a year's, yeah, you get a year to pay it back and there's a 3% surcharge added to it. But well, you need to be making sales in order to actually incur that VAT in the first place, right? Uh, but that's, that, I think, that 3% is the lowest rate you'll find in the market. It's 4.4, I think, uh, is the best. And this is at a time when the Irish government can borrow at nearly zero. Um, in fact, negative in, in real terms in, in certain cases. So um, uh, debt is probably not the way forward unless it's structural debt. And you mentioned capital investments. So if you think, for example, that um, you, that people are going to need uh, more spaces to sit because there's going to be more social distancing, and you you have a you have a a, a a requirement to build more seating, okay, borrow to f- do that capital spending. It's actually a perfect time too because a large number of the people who are going to be unemployed are actually going to be construction workers in many in many cases. So that'll be really good. Um, align yourself with the, the clear prevailing trend which is in green infrastructure so if it is the case that you know you're running a cafe if you can it, it, people will be very very happy to uh go to a cafe that that is a 100 percent uh, renewable energy that kind of thing um made a really important point about local so uh i, I live in limerick and we have um a, a, an award-winning butchers here garrett's and i was really worried about them Uh, because they're a family business and I know the family well, they're friends of mine, their kids play together. Um, I said, how are you getting on? I said, we've never, ever been busier. Never. They they, they sell really high quality meat and they have never been busier. Um, They they barely see their children. They're that busy because of course they're delivering. Um, And uh, I said, oh, you know, it must be shopping local. And uh, uh, Fiona said, no, it's not. It's not local at all. It's trust. So local, (laughs) equals trust i trust i believe and and in a in a place of increased uncertainty and in a world where there's increased uncertainty and increased anxiety anything that is accretive of trust is going to be a winner like it's just going to win if tater park is covid free i'm taking my kids to to tater park if um the hotel is it it can be certified as that i'm going you know what i mean if i if, if 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 i can go to it if i can take someone to a Take the kid to a to a country where I know the likelihood of the virus is lower. Happy days, right? Um, if I can purchase uh, things from a COVID-free supply chain, hmm. happy days, right? All of these things are now vitally important. So I think all of these things are opportunities for for new people and new new businesses. Uh, but anything that is accretive of or increasing of trust definitely going to be a winner and then the other major thing is don't borrow to finance current expenditure um because it's like it's like putting a holiday on a credit card you know um just don't do it (laughs) just don't do it Stephen, you were saying there about the trust and um the sort of certificate of being um corona free and you're absolutely right we have some of the retailers on our side who uh now they, they put up little things on them that has like, it's almost like a derm with, with a bar sign over it. Um, and I don't know how certified they are, but basically they um, package up everything wearing gloves and they, they detail what they're doing in their sort of bios. And like their station is like fully sanitized. They package up everything wearing gloves. They put it in and there's like, they write everything in the package of what they've done in terms of like sanitation and how it's all fully sanitized. And they do better than the other retailers on the site when they actually market themselves as like taking extra precautions from a coronavirus point of view. Um, like that. Yeah, that it's something is, that everyone needs to do now. Just to cause a little bit of a challenge, I suppose. I really hope that we don't go towards a civilization of too safe. You know, sometimes the world can over over indulge the safety protocols. Like you, you talk about HACCP there, and 
as a cafe owner, it was very restrictive in what we could do and what we couldn't do. You go to Scotland and they have pastries on a counter. In Ireland, that's illegal. You know, you have to have the cover with the glass and the sneeze screen. And it was way overboard for small business owners. So I hope that as a society, we don't go too extreme in the safety protocols. And I, 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 I personally uh, am a, I'm a, a friendly person. And, and, you know, I look forward to, to, to being surrounded by friends at a festival again and, and things like that. I want to finally, finally talk um, about communication in the time of COVID because obviously communication is something that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by. And, and it's really interesting as a, as a consultant watching how people are navigating things like um, COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. Um, but COVID-19 is a funny one because um, it, it, you can't really be seen to be taking advantage of it. How you message your, your, your um, customers is important. And I'm wondering, Lauren, do you have any advice for people um, who are communicating on social media about COVID-19? What, what advice would you give them to, to help them avoid looking like they're capitalizing on other people's mis- misfortune or, or poor health um, mm. or, that, or that they're not too glib about something that is very serious at, at the same yeah. time. The what, the, so I suppose at the beginning, and I'm, it's a good question to ask me because when obviously we didn't know the coronavirus was coming and a lot of people have said to us, oh, isn't it very convenient the coronavirus came around, you know, based on what your business is. And I was like, yeah, it was. And I think, I, I think the important thing with it, with when you're talking about the coronavirus and our whole message was this whole concept of shop local which was what all of the retailers were kind of saying as well when they were saying you know uh talking about the coronavirus the coronavirus has happened please help us because we have to close our doors and help us by shopping local and i think with the coronavirus as an example on its own it's quite important to sort of um substantiate your claim and we certainly, well, I felt like we certainly were doing it in that we were saying shop local and uh, shop it with these retailers. Obviously, we as a business are benefiting from it, but we are substantiating it in a way that we're not passing anything on to these retailers. So we're not charging them any subscription fee. We're not charging any commissions. So we can kind of say that. So us as a business, we uh, I think we're, we were doing everything right in that sense. And then for the retailers, one of the pieces of advice that I always gave them was, I was like, if you're saying to people, uh, please shop local with us, it's important for you then to support your local community as well. Yeah. And that was something that a lot of them were doing. And it gave them a lot of kudos, I think, when they were saying it. So they were like, shop local with me, but also I'm going to support my community. And that can be like your social community or literally like your neighborhood. So talk about the bakery next door that's doing deliveries or the butcher down the road who's, uh, you know, has the most amazing quality beef. And I think right. when you do that, it gives you a lot of legs to stand on. It makes you a lot more authentic. Um, and that certainly worked for, for us and it worked for a lot of our retailers. I think it's a really good um, piece of advice to, mm. to people to walk the walk and support the people. Yeah. Around. And I think in a, in a time like this, we absolutely need that. What about you, Garrett? Um, during COVID-19, did you find it hard to, to sell? Did you decide not to try and sell or work on, you know, deals or leads that you've been working on up until the, the pandemic hit? Communication is a great question. I think that during the most important thing, actually, during a crisis is communication. And this is something I learned in my last last business communication is key and it's not just across um to your customers it's to your all your stakeholders you know if you have a multi-stakeholder business like one of the things that that can happen quite quickly is panic and what initially you have to do is we started on this 20-week action plan we started having instead of a a monthly meeting we started having uh, daily meetings we went down to having a, a daily meeting with the entire team for 15 to 30 minutes For two reasons. One, to make sure that they all realized that we were here, we're still here, we're not going anywhere. The second was to allow a bit of spontaneity. You're missing in the office, people are feeling isolated. It's important that they get that communication piece in each day where it's just a chit chat about current day affairs, what are they doing? And that's something we we really embrace straight away. Um, The second part of communication is really towards your question about uh, cost cutting. You know, it 
it's an impact to the majority of businesses. So cost cutting, I think you have to call all of your suppliers. Face, you know, it's almost like a face to face and say, look, this has affected us in this way. And here's what we're going to do about it. Here's a plan where you we need to work together and come up with a structure that works for both of us in a win-win scenario. I think a lot of companies don't do that. They put their head in the sand and then they, they get they, they hope it's going to go away and it just won't and it becomes a toxic situation. But if you face the problem head on, which we did in communication, then it really allows you to have a better relationship with your suppliers, your vendors, etc., and uh, you can get out of it in a in a in a in the best approach. So I think communication is really strong. So let's let's fin- finish on the positive mode because that's, that's a, a, an uplifting tone. And I want to finish by asking uh, each of you uh, three pieces of advice for uh, SMEs uh, in terms of going forward for what they should do in terms of innovation or technology or or shifting their attitude even. So Stephen, we'll start with you. Uh, number one, avail of all of the the supports um, that the government is is providing. Um, you know, conversing with your own business model and, and everything else. You know, previously I said you know don't take out a loan if you if, if you if you can avoid it. But but you know there are lots of grants available. You can get your rates back and all that kind of stuff. Um, many times I've spoken to SMEs who are saying the government's doing nothing for me, and I said, well, have you applied for anything? And they say, no. Well. <laughs> Come on, you know, like like the, like the, the the government announced seven billion euros worth of of uh, various supports, lots of which are grant aided, in fact. Um, and to date, only four hundred people or four hundred SMEs have actually taken up some of those grants. So like that, so you can't if somebody offers you a voucher and you don't use the voucher, whose fault is it, right? So that's the first thing. Avail of the supports that are conversant with your business model. Second support is a second uh, piece of advice is to realize that, uh, exactly as Garrett said, this too shall pass, right? Um, so I, I never thought, I, I, was, I never thought after the last crisis that, the, that, I have to, that I'd have to live through another one, you know? <laughs> like as an economist, you study a lot of economic history and you think, well, that's my, that's my crisis, you know? Like in, in two, more gen, two more scholarly generations, somebody else is going to have to deal with a giant global economic meltdown. But till then, we're all good in the hood. <laughs> Turns out no. <laughs> Turns out no. Um, it shows what I know about forecasting. But um, the 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 this too shall pass. It'll probably pass quicker if if we can control the virus. It'll pass quicker than the previous one, and we're in a far far better position. The third thing is that there are there there is something fundamentally brilliant about Ireland, which is different to other countries, and that is the extent and depth of our social capital um so that's just like that's you know uh uh, uh entrepreneurs picking up the phone uh giving time uh, gary just j- j- just just said he does um that kind of stuff but also just uh, if you if you find an expert in an area and they're in a university you just ring them up they're not going to you know ch- they're not going to uh, uh uh be precious about it um, many people are are they're not just uh, interested to help they're actually anxious to help mm. uh, helping alleviates anxiety it's why uh, doctors have to tell each other when there is a crisis don't just do something stand there right because they all want to jump in and 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 help instantly so yeah. just be aware that there's a huge uh, net of, of 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 available help and not financial help just experiential help and 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 expert help that's available to you and just use your social networks to find them and if you don't have them make them because like i said uh you know i i'm a public servant i i literally view it as my job to serve the public you know and if the public ring me up i'm answering their phone yeah, their phone call like that's just how it is you know so um and, and i i know i speak for my colleagues when i uh when i say that, that genuinely most public servants feel like the public don't talk to them enough you know uh and i, I think that's pr- that's certainly true in the public sector in the private sector there's lots and lots of people who can uh who, who can help and i and it, it, it's a bit it's a bit redundant because most of the entrepreneurs that i know are talking to people constantly actually so so just you know do it more maybe Lauren. so i kind of already said this before but if you are a small um business owner particularly one that's working in retail and you're still selling online 
you need to tell people. And Stephen, you kind of um, said it there. Some of my retailers were ringing me up and they're like, you know, we're not getting, um, we're not getting any sales. And I'm like, okay, well, what have you done? What have you, have you posted on social? Have you told anybody? Have you told any of your old customers? And they're like, no. And I'm just like, how could you think you're going to get sales if you're not telling anybody? So use your community. If you have an email database of old customers, uh, if you work on a street that has other businesses, if you have a load of neighbors or friends or families, literally text them, uh, mail them on social media, tell them that you're still selling online. Or if you're on something like Bizu, tell them that you're selling on Bizu and get other people to literally market for you. Ask them to tell their friends, ask them to post on their social media channels. If you ever had any kind of influencer or influential person shop with you, or if they're one of them are your friends, ask them to post on their social media for you. I think in, in the time that we're in at the moment, there's a massive sense of community and people coming together and really wanting to help and support each other. So leverage that. Ask people to market for you. So that would kind of be my number one piece of advice is really try and use and benefit from word of mouth marketing at the moment my second one then is my second piece of advice is to go online um so <clears throat> that doesn't necessarily have to mean go and make a website even just go and make a social channel if you are if you are a small business owner that sells something uh, go make a twitter account or an instagram account or a facebook account or if you are a retail owner join something like bizu like really um, I suppose, embrace um, this opportunity. One thing that I always say to the retailers that I speak to is, do you want to be around in the next you know, five years? Do you want to still be in business in two years or three years? And if they say yes, I'm like, you need to go online. Otherwise you just, you, you won't survive basically. Then the third piece of advice is if you do go online to learn how to analyze you know the guys spoke earlier on about using data to inform decisions and it's so important like a lot of people who are online they just go online or they're on social media and they just are on social media for the sake of it but they don't actually analyze what they're doing and it doesn't have to be like really deep dive into a huge amount of big data like even things like uh, what day of the week do you sell more online what what time of the day do you get more engagements on your posts what products are you selling that are selling the most like in this kind of a weird time and use all of that data and information to inform what you're doing and change what you're doing because you probably have to change a lot of what you used to do um now at the moment just with, with everything that happened a lot of a lot of people's behaviors a lot of people's purchasing behaviors have changed yeah. a lot there's a really big piece of work i think there to be done in terms of how people need to analyze and uh, adapt thanks lauren and gareth um, so the three things that I'd say, um, firstly, is, you know, everything has changed, right? So all of your plans, your forecasts, you, you really, you can't look at any of that. What profit or sales you had predicted, you should just dismiss. That's, that's changed. The first thing you do when the crisis happens is to micro plan. So break everything down from years down to days. And what you're saying is you're trying to have positive days, Okay. So micro plan all things down to days. So take it day by day because you don't know yet where, where, where the outcome lays. So break everything down in your business down to days and try and win your days. And the second thing is prioritize, you know, prioritize things based on if you feel you have to in, in business, especially with expenses and costs of sales, you have to prioritize which things you feel are an absolute must keep in section A or category A and, and, and layer them down in terms of priorities and really be realistic in terms of what you can and cannot keep. The, your standards sometimes will just have to change in the short term. Um, and then I think, you know, one of the things I think is motivation and, and positivity. Um, Winston Churchill said, you know, if it feels like you're going through hell, just keep going. You know, and that's, and that's where we are right now. I, it motivates me to think of myself like a wartime CEO. Think like you're going through war right now and get yourself motivated to do the things to win your days and win every single day by doing things. If you can't do it in business, do it in life. 
you know, read a book, which you'd never read, read two lines, you know, do something, work out, uh, learn Spanish, do things like, like that and, and try and improve yourself because you always have your mind. If you lose your business, you have your mind and you can go, go into the next one uh, stronger and more prepared. Well, thanks very much to our panel. I really enjoyed that. I hope you got something out of it too. If you're uh, someone who's, who's about to start or, or, or are running a small or, or medium business, uh, it's great to get some insights from, from experts in the field. So thank you to Stephen Kinsella, um, Lauren Murphy and Garrett Flower. And it's over to Emmett Daniels in the Smurf uh, School of Business to uh, finish off. So Emmett, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jonathan. So my name is Emmett. I'm a marketing advisor at the UCD Smurfit Marketing Development Programme. And that concludes today's discussion on necessity being the driving force for innovation for SMEs. I'd first like to say a huge thank you to our guest speakers, Garrett, Lauren, Stephen, and our host, Jonathan, for what was a really, really engaging discussion. Particularly interesting, I thought, to hear the pieces of advice that our speakers have for SMEs to help them weather the current storm. Thanks also to Electric Ireland for their involvement and indeed partnership with the UCD Smurfit Marketing Development Programme over the last 18 years. Now, normally this event takes the form of a business breakfast, so we'd like to thank Electric Ireland for giving us the opportunity to take this event online for the first time in 18 years. Thanks especially to Raymond Bukan and Sarah Sharkey for their continued support throughout the organisation of this discussion. And finally, thank you very much to all of you who've tuned in and listened, and we really hope you take some value away from it.